right, let's go to review some things we talked about yesterday. We've been working on talking about the reflection of light. We said there's two types of reflection depending on the surface class. Two types of reflection. Specular, specular and <laughs> diffuse. What is specular reflection, Kendall? Reflection that produces... Audrey? Michael, what is specular reflection? You get a clear image. Why do you get a clear image? What causes specular reflection, class? Staying parallel so you have a smooth surface. Smooth surface causes specular reflection. And uh, what is diffuse reflection? Diffuse reflection produces, Kendall? Not a clear image, if any image at all. Not because there's no reflection, but the light rays don't stay parallel because, class? On an even surface, a rougher surface, right? Something with that which is not perfectly smooth. Um, we said the uh, ratio of reflected light to total light that falls on a surface. Reflectance. Um, we said a flat mirror is called a plain mirror. What type of image? We said there's five words we could use to describe plain mirror images. Give me one of them. Unmagnified. Unmagnified. Slightly darker. Slightly darker. Upright. Um, virtual, because they appear to be behind the mirror. Um, inverted. And not inverted, that would mean flipped, but you, she has the idea, it's not flipped upside down, that would be inverted, but it's kind of flipped backwards. What's the word, class? Reversed, actually reversed along the z-axis, but we use the term reversed for those plain mirror images. Mm -hmm. Yesterday when we changed gears, and we went to mirrors that we don't use as often necessarily, and uh, mirrors that are not flat, but rather they come from a ball or from a sphere. So we were looking at spherical mirrors yesterday. We said if the sphere's reflective surface is on the inside, you have to cut the sphere open to see the reflecting surface on the inside. That'd be like looking at the inside of the spoon, so to speak, though it's not perfectly spherical. Uh, we would have class A, concave mirror. Uh, by the way, can you imagine a spoon that was actually spherical? Like Normally we have a little bit of that ov oval shape tapering at the end, right? That's a normal spoon. And an actual, from a sphere, would be a little bit weird. But it's still that idea of concave, right? The reflecting surface on the inside. Flip the spoon over, and if the uh, surface were on the outside of the sphere class, we would have a convex mirror. Uh, we said that the center of the sphere is called the... The center of the sphere. So you have this big old ball of mirror. The very center of the sphere is called the center of, center of curvature. We represent it with the letter C. We call it the center of curvature. Now, Audrey, you mentioned vertex. The vertex isn't the center of the sphere or of the ball. It's once you chop off the mirror, it's the center of the... Anyone? It's the center of the actual mirror. It's the center of the mirror's... The surface itself is the vertex. We represent that with V. If we drew a line through the center of curvature and through the vertex, that line that we use in our pictures uh, is called the... Radius. Well, the distance from the center of curvature to the vertex, or really any point on the mirror, is the radius, but the line that goes through... Mm. We didn't study last night at all, did we? Yeah, it's a Wednesday night. We don't usually study on Wednesday, so we can tell, okay? Uh, principal axis, what is it, class? Principal, principal axis. Um, the next question was going to be, what's the distance from the center of curvature to the mirror or to the vertex in class? That is the radius, radius of curvature. Half the radius gives us something called the focal length. So if you were to find from center of curvature to that vertex of the mirror, the halfway point, that midpoint, would actually be the focal point. Good, where if you had a light source some infinite distance away, infinite, the sun for instance, if you had the sun uh, shining down on a spherical mirror, a concave mirror, the light would all focus at that one, roughly speaking, would focus at that one focal point. 
Um, whether or not it focuses clearly, we're going to talk about this later on today, Lord willing, um, depends on how big the mirror is, how big the mirror opens. The o size of the opening of a mirror is referred to as the... Aperture. Aperture, very good. The aperture of the mirror. Now, if I just measure, I have the mirror sitting here, take out my ruler and I measure from one side to the other. That's the... The length, what's a term that would mean length? No, you're thinking pre-cal. Linear. The linear aperture, the line length distance across the mirror is the linear aperture. But if we were to measure from the center of curvature to one edge of the mirror, to the opposite edge of the mirror, that angle is called the angular aperture. And if you have a big angular aperture, we're going to talk about it later, the light's not all going to focus at the focal point very well. But if it's a very small angular aperture, you'll get a better focal point. Um, the only math we've had so far was that fact that the focal length class equals half the radius of curvature. From there we draw, drawed, we drew some sketches uh, that showed, okay, here's where an object is, here's where the image should form. What do we call those sketches that use just a couple of rays? Ray diagrams, good. We call those three rays that we use the three principal rays. Can let's see how many of the principal rays you can remember. Not describing them, just naming them. Mm, Michael? Central. Central ray. Focal. Focal ray. Parallel. Hey, hat trick. Parallel ray. Got all three of them. Good. Central, focal, and parallel. The central ray, remember, class goes through the center of curvature, the letter C. And once it hits the mirror, it's at the normal technically, so it's just going to reflect right back through the center again. The uh, focal ray, where do you suppose it goes? The focal. the focal point. But when it hits the mirror, it reflects parallel to that principal axis. The parallel ray is going to start out parallel to the principal axis, but once it hits the mirror, it's going to reflect through the focal point. Now again, that assumes a small angular aperture. Even the example we saw yesterday, remember how they didn't all hit? Frankly, the angular aperture was a little big. But anyway, gives us a rough idea, at least, with these ray diagrams. And we were doing a ray diagram at the end of the hour yesterday. We've done number five, problem number five, A and B on page 291. Want to do number six, A and B, together now. So have your compass and straight edge out. And uh, let's pick up kind of where we left off yesterday, page 291. But let's do number six. Number six. And you know who just realized he forgot his compass and straight edge? This guy. At your seats, read number six, start setting it up while I go get my compass and straight edge. Remember everything else. Give me told you to get it, and uh, I forgot to get my own. Okay, so number six, A and B, one set up the drawing. So we have an object one and a half centimeters high. It's only three centimeters from the concave mirror, but the radius is 12 centimeters. So figure a spot to call your center of curvature. Measure 12 centimeters away. And you have your center of curvature and your vertex. All right, so far so good. 12 centimeters, measured out. Draw the arc again. We're working in two dimensions, not three. This represents cross section or a cutaway, if you will, of the mirror. We're missing a point that's very important to us. Focal point. 
The focal point. Now, where's that going to be, class? Six centimeters. Exactly halfway in between the other two. But the object, it says, is only three centimeters from the mirror. And it's just one and a half centimeters tall. So you should have a picture something like this. <clears throat> Let's just put it up here. Questions on the setup? Any questions at all on the setup here? 12 centimeter focal or radius, six centimeter focal length, three centimeter distance to object, which is only one and a half centimeters tall. All right. Let's go and draw our first ray, and uh, we'll let Audrey pick which ray she wants to draw. Uh, the central ray? All right, that's a pretty easy one. I like to start with easy ones. I appreciate Audrey obliging us here. And there's my central ray. Just draw a straight line. Make sure it hits the mirror, but just draw a straight line through the center of curvature. All right. The next ray that we might draw, and let's go to Kendall. Um, parallel. Parallel ray. So that one starts out in parallel. Easier said than done. And once it hits the mirror, it's going to reflect through the, through the focal point. So make, once it hits the mirror, direct it back now through the focal point. All right, Michael, the last ray. The focal, ray. the focal ray. What's that going to do? It's going to go um, through the focal point. It's going to go through the focal point. Now, obviously, like the central ray, if you just went to the center, you'd never hit the mirror. So we're going to hit the mirror. So we're going to direct it through the focus, but kind of like through the focus up to the mirror. And once it hits the mirror, Michael, it's going to reflect parallel. parallel, which again, easier said than done, but we'll get an approximation here of what looks parallel. All right. Questions on these three rays? So once it hits the mirror, make it parallel to the principal axis, like what you see on the board. a little bit. All right, so we've got a green central ray, a blue uh, parallel ray, and a pink focal ray. And where these three rays all converge, now obviously they converge here, right? At the, at the object, where the three rays after they reflect converge tells you where the image will be formed. But um, thoughts? They don't converge. The pink ray is going off this way, the green ray is coming down here, and the blue ray is ever so slightly getting further away. They're never going to converge. You know what that means? We're not going to get a real image. But if you were to do this, imagine now if the central ray were extended through the mirror. Now, does light go through the mirror, class? No, light reflects off the mirror. But imagine that this central ray could somehow continue into the mirror. Let's take this blue ray. See how it's coming off at an angle here? Well, let's assume for a moment that somehow it could also continue into the mirror. 
And let's assume that somehow this pink ray, the focal ray, somehow could continue after it reflects, instead of reflecting off the mirror, let's assume somehow it could reflect into the mirror. Do you see that these three rays appear to converge behind the mirror? That's the top of the object. The rest of the object simply falls beneath it. And so it appears that the image is going to form behind the mirror. Does that make sense? This type of situation results in what type of image? Same thing that a plane mirror will form. A virtual image. If it really reflected off, you'd get a real image, but it doesn't. It gives you this virtual image. Does that make sense? Let's do this. Uh, if, you're, if you're there uh, watching on YouTube, just draw yourself a line. Pick any random point and make an arc. I'm going to give these students a handout that they can use that already have some uh, setups here. I'm giving them, I'm going to hold it up for the camera. I'm giving them a piece of paper. I drew some and constructed some of these. It's just a principal axis. You've got a, uh, the radius of curvature marked already. You've got the focal point marked already. So we're just going to use this. I'll draw a new one on the board. So if you are drawing on your own paper, no big deal. Open your compass up whatever length you want. Just pick some random length and make it on. For you folks, use whichever one of those three sketches that you want. I'm going to go and pick a random point here. I'm going to open my compass up um, that much. Now, the key here is if you're drawing this yourself, you need to find the midpoint. You could construct it like we do in geometry, or you could just measure and cut it in half. I'm going to go centimeters since they're a little bit uh, easier to use. I've got uh, 52 centimeters, half of that's 26. There's my focal point, center, and vertex. Again, students here at your seats, you're in the classroom. Use whichever of those three you want. The points are already marked, you just need to label. So we saw yesterday, at the end of the hour, we put an object back here, and we got a little image that actually converged here. Now we put an image way up here, and it seemed like the image formed in there. Now let's take an object, draw any arrow, any height, not too tall, now you want it to be able to hit the mirror, draw an arrow or something, put it just a little in front of the center of curvature. Put a little arrow just a little in front of the center of curvature. Don't make it too tall now. You want it to be able to stay below where the height of the mirror, so don't want it getting up above the mirror's height. And let's do one more ray diagram together. Let's start by drawing maybe, let's start with Michael this time, since he went last, last time. Central ray. The central ray. Now, remember, just like last time, remember, the center's way back here. So when we draw the central ray, we're going to draw the ray, yes, technically goes through the center, but also goes up and hits the mirror? Is it going to hit the mirror? No. So for this situation, because it's just placed in a spot where it's not going to hit the mirror, we'll kind of ignore the central ray. That's okay. We have three principal rays. We need at least two of them. You'll notice, by the way, in the textbook, remember I pointed out oftentimes they don't use the central ray? Yeah, that's one reason. All right. Uh, well, how about a different ray then, Michael? The parallel ray. That we can do. We can definitely make a ray that goes uh, roughly parallel to the principal axis. Once it hits the mirror class, it goes through the focal point. The final ray is what, Audrey? We just did the parallel ray, where it starts off parallel, hits the mirror, and bounces through the focal point. The focal ray. The focal ray. And that, of course, is going to go down through the focal point. And once it hits the mirror, what's it going to do? Class? It's going to bounce back parallel to the principal axis.
Now, these three rays don't perfectly converge for me, but they're very close. They may perfectly converge for you, I'm not sure. Again, the green ray is just kind of out there, but it seems like the three of them intersect right around this point. But they do actually converge, don't they? Meaning the image that we get here, class, is going to be a real image because the light really reflects off and converges. Now, you'll notice that the dot was the top of, here's the top, there's the top, so it's flipped our image over here. Um, but uh, there we go. We get this effect here. Any right? questions on that? What do we notice about this second arrow, the reflected image compared to the first, besides the fact that it's upside down? It's a tiny bit larger, isn't it? Remember yesterday when it was back here, the other one was a little bit smaller. Now it's a little bit larger. So was, by the way, the one on the last one we did. The virtual image was a little larger. Okay. Again, plain mirrors don't do that, but spherical mirrors could. What else do we notice? Related to its distance from the mirror. It appears to be further away from the mirror than the uh, other one was. Um, and by the way, imagine if I pushed it still a little closer. Right? Well, the, the pink ray would look the exact same, wouldn't it? But the blue ray would end up hitting the mirror lower and reflecting further. So as I push the image clo the object closer, the image continues to get further away. That leads us to the next thing in your notes, and that is cases of image formation. Cases of image formation. So we're going to start by talking about concave mirrors here. So cases of image formation for a concave mirror. That's what we've been showing so far all along, our concave mirrors. In your textbooks, you can follow along on page 284 to 285. 284 to 285. There are six different cases of image formation for a concave mirror. Case number one is something we've already talked about, and that is that if an object is an infinite, quote unquote, distance away from the mirror. Well, again, if it's Michael that's an infinite distance away from the mirror, are we going to get Michael showing up in the mirror at all? No. But if it's a source of light, like the sun, a, an infinite distance away, you will see something, because light will end up reflecting off. Michael doesn't reflect enough light off of his body to really show up in a mirror if he's, you know, at the other side of the PE field. But, oh, it's a really big mirror. Uh, but the sun does, or the moon as it reflects its light in the evening, it reflects enough light. So if an object is an infinite distance away, we said, within reason, the light rays are all going to reflect to the focal point. That's why we call it the focal point, right? And so we're going to get just a little dot of light called a point image at the focal point. We're going to get a little point image at the focal point. If the object is an infinite, again, that doesn't mean literally infinite, but really, really far distance away from the mirror. Now, as the object gets closer, we would see what we saw in our first ray diagram we did yesterday. And you see something like this at the top of page 285, case two. Do you notice that little bishop chess piece is a little bit behind the center of curvature? Do you notice that the little image chess piece has been formed kind of like our arrow did yesterday? It's flipped upside down and it's smaller and it's uh, formed between C and F. Do you see that in case two? So case two, the object is at an infinite distance away, but it's still beyond the center of curvature. Second case is where the object is beyond the center of curvature. Well, here we're going to get an image that is, first of all, real. The light rays really converge. They reflect, they converge, they form the image, a real image. It's also upside down. It's an inverted image. By the way, if you want to tuck this thought away, all real images are inverted. It's what mirrors do. It's a real image. It's an inverted image, but it's also smaller. We'll use the term reduced. We get a real image that is inverted and reduced if the object is beyond the center of curvature. 
So we started an infinite distance away. We've now moved closer, but we're still behind the center of curvature. Case three, what if the object comes all the way at the center of curvature? What if the object is placed at the center of curvature? Well, you see the ray diagram there. Look at the image. Compare the image to the object. They're the same size, aren't they? Now, the image is still upside down, and the image is still really formed by converging light rays. So we still have a real image. It's still inverted, but now it's unmagnified. It's a real image. It's inverted. It's unmagnified. Notice, we started with the object how far away, class? And what did you get when you had that infinite distance light source? You just got a little point. As the object moves closer, you actually now get an image. Now, it's, it's little, it's reduced, but you actually get an image. As you get closer, it becomes the same size. What do you think will happen as I push it closer? Well, the last ray diagram we just drew showed that. If the object gets in front of the center of curvature, but behind the focal point, so between C and F, case number four, if the object gets between C and F, well, what we just drew in our last ray diagram together, the image was still real, light rays really converged off the mirror, it was still inverted, all real images are inverted, say that a second time, but now the image, look at case four in your textbook, we see it with a bishop chess piece, versus the arrow that we drew earlier, because we are not drawing bishop chess pieces, because we're not cool like that. It's now bigger. It is, we would say, enlarged. That make sense? Now the next case, we didn't do a ray diagram with it, but we'll look at their ray diagram. What if you keep moving the object forward and you put the object at the focal point? Well, if you drew a focal ray, um, it goes through the focus. It is at the focus. How would you go through the focus? Going through the focus would go straight down. So they didn't use the focal ray. They used the parallel ray and the central ray. And notice those two rays run parallel to each other, meaning they would never intersect. Does that make sense? So if the object is placed at the focal point, no image is produced. Now let me explain it another way. Remember we started an infinite distance away and we brought the object closer and closer and closer. And as the object got closer, what happened to the image? It got bigger and bigger and bigger. It also, notice where the location of the image is. The image is in close. The image moves further back, further back, further back. Literally, as you get to the focal point, you have an infinitely large image infinitely far away. Does that make sense? Could you see an infinitely large image infinitely far away? No. That's why we could say there's no image produced. But then something very unusual happens. As soon as you get in front of F, Oh, that was the projector. I thought my camera had died for a second. The projector decided it didn't want to run anymore. If you get in front of F, well, you can't get bigger than infinitely large, can you? So what you lose, you lose the real image completely. And suddenly, you switch from real images all this time to a virtual image. Now, virtual images will always be upright. Just as real images are always inverted, virtual images are always upright. This would be the case we did for our first ray diagram today. Remember we had it in front of that focal point, and so the image seems to form behind the mirror. We see that example at the bottom there with case six, a virtual image that's upright, but remember it was bigger. It was enlarged. Now, you may recall what I told you about real images the other day. I said you would really need some kind of projection in order to see it. Maybe a projection screen or even a camera, something to capture it. 
or you be in just the right spot that your eye, the, the, the retina of your eye could catch it, but there has to be something there. If you're standing off to the side, you won't see an image at all. Virtual images are much more easy to see. That's why mirror images that we would use, use these virtual images. This would be like a cosmetic mirror. You ladies, I think, said you have a mirror where at least one side of it makes you a little bit bigger, or maybe you've seen it at the makeup counters you walk past. If you get in just the right spot, you don't see anything, right? If you look at it, if you look right up close like this and leave a little grease mark from your nose, um, you don't really look any bigger, do you? But as you pull it away, you get bigger and bigger. Don't tell me you haven't played with this. You probably played with your sister's mirror. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I have sisters too, so I played with sisters. Pull it back further, further you get bigger, 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 and all of a sudden, what happens? You get infinitely big, and you, there's, if everything's gone. You put your face at the focal point. And if you continue to pull it back, suddenly it flips you upside down, doesn't it? Right? You're now seeing those real images from the object being inverted. Right? So that's what's being produced here. But if you want to make this note, this case right here, case six, is the case of a cosmetic mirror. It's a slightly concaved mirror. Just slightly but a slightly concave mirror is going to produce that effect. Now, I've got a couple of videos that I want you to watch. If you're on YouTube, um, I want you to go ahead and watch these. I've got a feeling that's going to take up the rest of the hour. We may come back with a part two, but I'm going to give you the homework now in case we don't. For homework this evening, I need you to read over pages 284 to 290. I need you to read over pages 284 to 290. On pages 290 to 291, pages 290 to 291, I want you to answer questions 17, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27. So basically 17 to 27 odd and 28. 17 to 27 odd and 28. So 17, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, and 28, answering those questions. There are three videos in the description of this video. I want you to watch all three in the order listed, if you would please. And if we have time after the videos, we'll come back.